Welcome to the St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship Podcast. Today, one of our teaching leaders, Brett Tatko, will be discussing Genesis chapters 17 and 18. St. Louis Young Adults Bible Study Fellowship, or BSF, is currently meeting virtually on Zoom every Monday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Central Time. For more information and to connect with our class, visit bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. That's bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. Now let's prepare our hearts, open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 17, and join Brett as he shares truths from God's Word. Hey everybody, good evening. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Welcome to BSF. Uh, We've got another week that we're going to jump into God's Word and see what's been happening in the life of Abraham. We missed everyone at Thanksgiving. We had uh, time to read through most of Genesis, and we made it right up to the passage that we're in this week. So there's a lot in here for us. Let me pray. We'll get started, and we'll take a look at God's covenant with Abraham, the covenant of circumcision. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the beauty of your word, the way that you have woven it together to create a beautiful story of your love for humanity, your desire to bring about the restoration and the redemption of your people. Lord, thank you for sharing with us the way that you interacted with Abraham, the man that you chose to be the father of the nation that would bring forth the Redeemer. Thank you for your word. Open our hearts tonight so that we can hear from you. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, at any rate, I, I want to share a little bit of a story of mine from my past when I was uh, first dating who's the woman who's currently my wife. Her name is Vic. She's one of our lecturers here. We began dating at the end of my freshman year of college. It was right the last two, three weeks of school. We went on a couple of dates and then we went away. We went home. Uh, she went her way for the summertime. I went my way for the summertime. And we began communicating via letters. This was a pre-internet era. It was the early 90s. Email was sort of maybe out there, but when you were at home or when you were off campus, there was no way that you could do that. And so we wrote letters. Now, there's a back and forth nature of letter writing. So, you know, you send one and then you wait and then you receive one and then you send one. It's kind of like tennis. You're, you're, You're volleying back and forth and you're waiting to hear back from the person you're writing to before you send another letter. That's just, I mean, maybe that's not how the world did letters, but that's at least the pattern that emerged for us. At one point, the letter stopped. I stopped receiving letters, and, you know, I, I didn't know exactly why. Uh, and so the silence, the, the lack of communication, I began to fill in with my own narrative, my own story as to what happened. And the story went something along the lines of, she's not interested, she's moved on to somebody else, she thinks I'm weird, or she discovered that I'm a lot less exciting than maybe she thought I was, or maybe I said something in a, the former letter that was somehow offensive or I just filled it in. And basically the way that I filled in that story was that this relationship is not going to go anywhere. She's moved on. And I really made no other effort to communicate with Vic that summer. I I just decided that the narrative that I had written was accurate, was correct. And I was going to move on with my life because she was obviously moving on with hers. And I think as we look back at our story last week of Abraham and Sarah and the involvement of Hagar, you know, they felt the same way. There had been this silence that had occurred in their experience with the Lord. The Lord had told Abram that he was going to be a great nation. He was going to have children and offspring more numerous than the sands of the seashore, more than the stars in the sky. And nothing had really happened. And there was no communication from God. And so Sarah, Sarai, and Abram filled in that gap by involving Hagar. Obviously, you know, Abraham, Abram decided, Sarah decided, if this is going to happen, well, you know, Sarai, it's not going to be with you. It must be with Hagar. And so they began to write the, their own version of the story that God had started. They filled in the gaps. They filled in the silence with their own narrative. And we can do this as well. 
You know, we can look at the situation that we're in. We can look at the circumstances of our lives. We could look at the things that we struggle with. We could look at the pain that we have, the the disjoint, the disjointed family experiences that we have, and, and we can say, you know, uh, we can write it. We can fill in the gaps. We can say, you know, God's forgotten about me. God doesn't care. Uh, God doesn't have the ability to solve this problem that I'm having in my life. And so we want to fill in the gaps of our own lives. And, and I think that's a natural tendency for all people. And when we left Abram and, and Sarai and Hagar at the end of chapter 16, you know, this is, we, we didn't really know what was going to happen. Is God going to show up? What's God going to do? How is God going to resolve now this overly complicated mess that Abram and Sarai and Hagar and Ishmael have now gotten into. And in Genesis 17, what we're going to see is that God is going to show up. He is going to show up and he is going to shock Abram and Sarai and Hagar and Ishmael with his plan, with his power, and with his ability to navigate them out of this situation and into the place that he has for them, a place of blessing, uh, a place of land and a place of offspring. So we're going to take a look at Genesis 17. Grab your Bibles, open them up. We've been progressing through the story of, of Abram, and we're going to finally see why I've been struggling with. Is it Abram or Abraham? If you've been wondering, Brett, what's your problem? Can you not read? Here's why. Uh, Genesis 17, the main, the main truth that I think we can walk away from in this passage is that God is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. God is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. This passage begins, chapter 17 begins, much the way that uh, many other sections of Scripture, at least in Genesis, have begun in the story of, of Abraham. God shows up. God appears to Abram when he was 99 years old. Uh, the Lord said to him, I am the Lord God Almighty. And, and really, if you look back at the pages of Genesis, God's appearance in human history is really what's been driving this narrative, this narrative story. Uh, this is the fourth time that Abraham, that, that God has appeared to Abram. And there was another time in this, in these last few chapters, since chapter 12, when God appeared to Hagar. So for this one family group, God has appeared five times and he has dealt with them. He has spoken with them. He has revealed things about himself to them. The first thing that God reveals to Abram is who he is. He, he, we've seen this before, but we're seeing it again tonight. God says to Abram, I am God almighty. This is an I am statement that God says about himself. We've seen God say before, I am your shield, Abram. And so we begin to see God revealing himself progressively to Abram over these times that he's appeared to him. Uh, this is something that when, when God tells his people who he is, Friends, we want to we want to look at that. We want to see that when your professor says this is going to be on the exam, we write it down. And when God says things about himself, when he says I am God almighty, that is something that we want to underline and look at and remind ourselves about because because God's character is consistent. It is true. If if God is El Shaddai, God almighty, if that was true for Abram, it's true for you. It's true for me. It's true for us. And so remember that uh, when God says, I am, that's important for us to remember. God spends time in verses one through eight of chapter 17, explaining what he is going to do. Many times in scripture, when God shows up, when he speaks to the prophets, when he speaks to his people, he tells them, I want you to know what I'm about to do. Right, And then, and then scripture reveals to us what God did. And then God might come again and say, I told you I was going to do it, and I did it. I was true to my word. And so this is, this is God telling Abram in verses 1 through 8, Abram, here's what's going to happen. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what's about to happen. And so there's several things that, that he tells him. First of all, he says, walk before me and be blameless. We're going to deal with that in just a little bit. But this is what God says, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. And so we get the name change, and God says, I'm going to make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations, 
and kings. And so God's told Abram this before. He's told Abraham, you're going to be a great nation. You're going to receive land and you're going to receive a blessing. But God is really coming in again. These are all the things that God is going to do. There's nothing in here that that in this first eight verses where there's, there's work for Abram. This is all God. God is going to do these things. And so remember that there was a mandate that was established for Adam and Eve and also for Noah and his family to fill the earth and subdue it. And we've been wondering since Genesis 3.15, who is going to be the family that will ultimately have the offspring that will crush the head of the serpent? And in this section, God is telling us it is going to be the family of Abraham. He is going to be the one who is going to fulfill the creation mandate. The earth is going to be filled. There's going to be nations that come from Abraham and ultimately from Sarah. He is going to fill the earth with his offspring. Now, subduing the earth, there are going to be kings that come from Abraham's line. We were told that here as well. Now, subduing the earth is going to be more complicated because now one of these offspring is going to have to crush the head of the serpent. The serpent must be subdued. You cannot rule over the earth if you will not rule over sin and death. And and that future child of Abraham that would do that, we know is Jesus. But right now, we know that it's Abraham's family. They are the ones to watch and see what God is going to do, how God is going to bring about the end of the curse uh, of rebellion that began with Adam and Eve in the garden, eating the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat. God also promises in this section that he's going to give the land of your sojourning to uh, the nation of Israel as an everlasting possession. So again, it's it's the, the promise of offspring. It's the promise of land. And finally, God says to him, I will be their God. And friends, the reality is, is that there is no blessing that we can experience on this earth, and certainly not in the time of Abraham, that would happen apart from God. We must be aligned with God if we are to experience true blessing in this world. We've seen it. We've seen it with Cain. We have seen Cain deviate from God's plan. There was no blessing there. There was no fruitfulness there. There was no flourishing that happened in Cain's line. Uh, the unrighteous people who were alive in the day of Noah, they did not experience blessing apart from the Lord. They experienced judgment. Same with the builders of the Tower of Babel. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They were disobeying God's command to disperse. There was no blessing. There was no fruitfulness that was found apart from God. So again, it's a reiteration of that three-part blessing that God has given to Abraham, which is the promise of a multitude of nations, offspring, It is the promise of land, and it is a promise of blessing. We're seeing God reiterate that here to Abraham and God saying, I will establish my covenant with you that I will surely do this, Abraham. And furthermore, I'm changing your name from Abram to Abraham, which means father of many nations, uh, father of a multitude. So this, this name change is wrapped up in that. And the reason that God can make these promises is because he wants Abraham to know I am God Almighty. I am a God who can do exactly what I promised. I have the power to do exactly what I said, Abraham. And so God has revealed himself to Abraham. He has revealed his power. He has revealed his intent. And as we get into verses 9 through 14, there are some things that Abraham is expected to do as a sign, as a, as a person who is receiving this covenant. First of all, I mentioned this earlier, this idea of walking before me and be blameless. This is what God said in, in up in chapter 17, chapter or 17, verse 1. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you. And so again, this idea of walking with God, we have seen other people in Genesis who have walked with God. Enoch walked with God and was no more because God took him. And so he was in uh, this notion of walking with God conveys an ongoing relationship with God. Remain in relationship with God. Jesus told his disciples, I am the vine, you are the branches, remain in me. Because life, uh, blessing, beauty, things in this world that, that God wants to do can be accomplished by people who remain in relationship with him. And so that's the first part of it is to walk with God. And the other part of this that God says is to be blameless. Uh, Noah was mentioned as being blameless. 
And so this is the same thing that God is looking for in Abraham. We know that Abraham nor Noah, we know that they were not perfect people. There are places in their lives where we can point to things that looked like sin, potentially. The the Bible is silent on that, but there are some places we can point to and say, hey, if you're supposed to be blameless, what about getting drunk, Noah? What about going into the land of Egypt, Abraham, when you lied about your wife? So these, these men were not perfect. But what the Bible does tell us in Genesis 15, 6 is that Abraham believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. So Abraham's belief it is it really seems to be what God is asking for. You need to continue to believe uh, in what I am going to do, Abraham. And, and, and that, that, future, that future promise, the promise of nations, the promise of a son with Sarah had yet to be realized. And so there's a, there's a mandate to continue uh, to believe there's a direction that God gives to Abraham, and it's, it seems like a tough one, right? Uh, Abraham and all the males of his household would need to become circumcised as a sign of the covenant. And so the interesting thing, at least in the Bible, about signs is that the sign will always precede the fulfillment. So in this situation, circumcision is going to precede the fulfillment of the covenant, the fulfillment of the promise that that Abraham is going to become the father of many nations. And Noah had a sign, the rainbow was a sign that God would never wipe out all life again. Now, now God hasn't done that yet, but the sign came first. And so when we see covenants, when we see signs of the covenants, those signs will precede the fulfillment of of the promise. So look for that in scripture. Look for covenants. Look for the signs. The signs are going to always be first. Uh, circumcision was not just for Abraham, for, for his bloodline. Circumcision was going to be for all males who were in the household. Now, we don't know all of the men who were there. There were 318 that went and fought against the kings. We know one of them was Eliezer of Damascus. We'll read more about him in the future. So there was a, a, a broader group of people who were going to be a part of this covenantal sign, not just Abraham and his genetic offspring, but those who were aligned with Abraham. Now, I can imagine um, that there were many interesting conversations that Abraham had to have with his household, and he had to explain to them what was going on. He was like, friends, God has promised to make me into a great nation. And the sign of that, the thing that, that I must do in obedience is to circumcise myself and my household. You know, I imagine people were given a choice. Are you with me? Do you believe that God is going to do this? Do you believe what I'm telling you or not? And so there was an opportunity for Abraham's household and Abraham himself to respond in faith to what God had asked Abram, uh, Abraham and by extension the broader, the broader family that he was in. Uh, to go forward with this act of circumcision. Now, circumcision, it, biblical scholars maintain that that other groups and people at this time may have been practicing circumcision. This wasn't something that was specifically created for the for Abraham and Abraham's household. But the, the reality is, is that when we look at what's happening in chapter 17, this entire section is dealing with human reproduction, right? This whole notion of like offspring, and circumcision; these are all related to you know reproductive acts of humanity. And, and the reality is, is that God is the one who created reproduction. All aspects of it, the the pleasurable activity that we refer to as sex, everything that happens on a cellular level, the the meiosis, the fetal development, the the process of, of you know cells splitting and babies developing, and all these things. Uh, the birth process, all of these things are part of what God declared as very good in Genesis 1.31. So this is something where we're, we're really focusing on and we're thinking about this notion of producing offspring. And so circumcision is a sign that we think it's unusual. Like if you, if you wanted people to know that you were a, a part of some group, like a bumper sticker seems like a better idea. Or uh, maybe like a clever hat, something that would be visible to other people that would identify you as being part of God's family. Why would God choose circumcision, which is something that isn't really visible as you go about your daily life and interact with people around you? They're not going to know whether or not you're circumcised. And the, the interesting thing is that the, the time when you would when you would 
realize circumcision, when you would know that it was there, would be during that time, that, that, during that moment of reproduction with your spouse. In that time, in that place, there's a physical reminder of this covenant that God has established with Abraham. Abraham would have that physical sign. Abraham's family would have that, that physical sign. The men in Abraham's household, during that time of physical intimacy, they would be reminded again and again, that God is going to make Abraham into a great nation. The covenant would be present during that, during that physical act of intimacy. As we skip ahead to verses 23 to 27, we can see that Abraham's response was immediate obedience. And apparently, the men in Abraham's household wholeheartedly agreed to go, to go along with him in this. Abraham was circumcised. He was 99 years old. Ishmael was circumcised. Uh, he was uh, 13 years old at the time. The men in Abraham's household were circumcised. There was immediate obedience to this activity. The principle for this first section is that God's character is revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. God's character is revealed in the pages of Scripture. So I mentioned this this time when I was writing letters back and forth to Vic and told you that I, I wrote my own story as to what happened. And, you know, I, I just, I, you know, I just kind of thought, like, I just kind of based it on what I thought was, was right. You know, I didn't go back and, and, and read her letters again and try to figure out if there was something that she wanted to communicate to me in them. You know, I, I never considered that maybe she was sick, maybe she was busy, you know, maybe she was without a pen. Uh, wh- whatever it was, I, whatever reality may have existed in her life at that time, I decided that I was right. What I had decided about the situation was right and true and accurate, and I was going to go with that. And I made no effort to really write back to her. Uh, I, I made no effort to try and figure out, like, hey, are you okay? Uh, I just decided, like, my narrative, my story that I had created was accurate and right. And it was a justification for me to respond the way that I did, which was by stopping writing back to her. And I think that this happens to us in, in our experience with the Lord. Uh, we feel like God is quiet in our lives. Uh, God isn't, isn't doing something that we're expecting him to do. You know, what, what, we, what we want to do is, is uh, we just want to decide that we're right. We want to decide that our explanation or our rationale for whatever's happening is the right one instead of reminding ourselves of who God is. We can go back and when there's those times when we feel like God is quiet to go back and look at the scriptures again and say, Lord, help me see who you are. Help me see the kind of God you are. We can re-examine the ways that God has revealed himself, the way that he has kept his promises to people in the past. And we can, we can remind ourselves of who God is. And, and, you know, there might be another reason for God's silence that, that we are maybe not not ready to examine yet, but maybe maybe there's a flaw in our narrative in our story. You know, we can think back on what God has done before in our lives, and rest assured that even though God seems quiet today, He is still at work. He is still working, even though we can't always see it and we aren't always aware of it. God had a plan for Abraham and for Sarah and for Hagar and for Ishmael and now for Isaac. And God was going to carry that out, even though it took a long time. God was still working. So the question for you, for me, is what's the story that maybe you've written for the reason that you're in some challenging situation, some desert place in your life, uh, you're experiencing loss, uh, you know, we're in a pandemic, and so, okay, yeah, there is loss. But, but you're experiencing you know, work changes, relationship changes, frustration with the way that your life is today, and, and, and you've come up with a narrative. You've written a story that explains why it is this way. And I think what we have to challenge ourselves with is, you know, what if we reevaluate who God is? What does it look like in our situation, in our circumstances, in our lives to say, you know, there are some things that we've learned about God in our study of Genesis, that can inform what's going on in our lives today. We can look at, you know, God's timeliness. We can look at the patience that's required of God, God's people. And we can say, I, that might be what's going on here. I need to be patient. I need to wait 
Uh, there, there, I might need, you know, there might be other things that we need to do. Cain needed to confess his sin. There are things that we can look at in the pages of this story and say, you know, that might apply to me. That might be something that I need to do. I just need to wait well. I need to not do something with the Egyptian hand servant, whatever that would be in your life. You know, um, and I think the other thing that we want to remind ourselves of is that God can achieve unexpected results. It, it's it's going to happen in the pages of Scripture. We're not just going to see unexpected results in the life of Abraham and Sarah, but we can experience that as well. God can achieve the unexpected in our lives because that is part of his character. It is part of who he is. So let's take a look at this next section. I, I never really explained the divisions, but there's going to be two of them. We just got done with one of the divisions. It's really looking at the covenant sign of circumcision. And so we looked at chapter 17. We looked at 1 through 14. And then a little bit at the end of chapter 17, which uh, helped us see Abraham's application. So that was kind of our first division. Our second division is going to be looking at the promise of Isaac. And that's going to be chapter 17, 15 through 22. And then uh, the section in chapter 18, 1 through 15, we're going to look at Isaac's birth is promised. And we're going to look at those two sections to, uh, to see how that's going to unfold. So first of all, chapter 17, verse 15, God lets Abraham know that Sarai is a part of the plan. It's not Hagar. It is Sarai, and now her name is going to be changed to Sarah. Now, these two names both can mean princess or noblewoman, and so it's not totally clear what the name change means there, but her name is changed as well. Abraham's name went from exalted father, Abram, to father of a multitude, Abraham, and so Sarah gets a name change as well. And so as God begins to explain in verses 15 through 17 that from Sarah's body, you will have a son. Abraham is really beyond his expectations. He had no idea this was even possible. He laughs. Uh, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Uh, Abram then asks if, if there's a place for Ishmael. Is it possible that Ishmael could take on this role of being the covenant promise recipient? And God says no. God says there's blessing for Ishmael. Uh, He will become a great nation, but his covenant will be established with Isaac, who will be born about a year from today uh, to Sarah. Sarah will bear a son, you'll call his Isaac, and God's covenant would be with him. Now, the implication in all this is that Sarah's not pregnant yet. And so when Sarah becomes pregnant, it will be after the sign of circumcision has been carried out. Sarah will then become pregnant she will then give birth to a, a baby boy named Isaac, who will be the beginning of uh, God's fulfillment of multitude of nations from this man, Abraham. So we then, uh, if we jump forward, uh, we can see in verse 18 that Abraham shows uh, radical hospitality to three strangers. We also sort of learn that these three men were not your typical guests. So let's take a look here at that, that section. We're in chapter 18, 1 through 8. Again, this is another appearance. So so God, the, the events of chapter 17 are over and done. God has appeared to Abraham, changed his name, told him about circumcision, and God has then left. And so now God is on the scene again in chapter 18. Uh, again, there were probably many, many, many cool things that Abraham did in his life, right? There was like cool stuff, the traveling, you know, the the fighting against the armies. Uh, I'm sure there was a ton of stuff that we would love to know more about. This is not a biography of Abraham's life. That's not what this is. This is a biography or a journal of the times when God showed up and interacted with Abraham, and interacted with Sarah, and interacted with Hagar. That is what we're going to find in Scripture, is where God is interacting with humanity. We're going to learn about people that God interacted with, right? We're going to learn about Abraham. We're going to learn about Sarah. We're going to learn about Jacob and Esau, and we're going to learn about people. But we're going to learn about them in the context of how God related to them and and revealed himself to those individuals. So the Bible is more about God and less about people. But it's a great place to go and learn about how God interacts with with people. We'll find that all over the pages of Scripture. So at any rate, chapter 18, God's back again, three guests. We, we don't know right away who they are. Abraham shows them great hospitality. You know, he, he almost begs them 
to come and partake of his food, uh, his, his opportunity to give them, you know, wash their feet. He, he drags them in uh, to his home and he provides a great meal for them and they get the best, right? Fine flour made into bread, fresh bread, super delicious. They get the tender calf. Uh, and then also it talks about the curds and the milk, and he gives them this great spread. And and Abraham didn't do this meal. You know, sometimes like with Thanksgiving, if I'm cooking the turkey, like I'm excited about having some turkey. But Abraham doesn't partake. He waits on the three guests as they eat underneath the trees uh, near his tent. And so that's verses one through eight. Abraham and Sarah are showing great hospitality to these three men. Now, as we look in verses nine through 15, we begin to see that these are not your typical guests. Uh, They know some stuff that maybe typical travelers wouldn't know. They know, for example, that Abraham's wife was named Sarah. And I don't know how much he publicized, hey, my wife's got a new name. Used to be known as Sarai, now she's known as Sarah. These guys knew it. These guys knew that her name was Sarah. Where is your wife, Sarah? Um, They then go on to say that, that, and then we find out that it's the Lord. This is the Lord who's here now as a guest. So Abraham is entertaining the Lord for a meal. Uh, and um, again, the, the promise, the confirmed promise of Sarah's coming birth is reiterated by the Lord himself. And Sarah's in earshot, right? She's inside the tent. Her response is the same as Abraham's, right? I'm too old. You know, should, she laughs to herself and she says, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have this pleasure? The other way that we know that these guys were not your average visitors is that Sarah was thinking this to herself, And the Lord knew her thoughts. The Lord knew that she had laughed. Uh, The Lord knew that she did not believe that this was going to happen. And, um, you know, this this visitor, who we know is the Lord, had supreme confidence that the Lord was able to do all things. This is God Almighty that we're talking about here. He is able to do all things. Uh, There's a little bit of an interchange at the end where Sarah denies her laughter. Uh, Again, this isn't going to work because the Lord knows our hearts. Uh, The Lord knows Sarah's heart. The Lord knows my heart. The Lord knows your heart. So friends, if there is something in your heart, you might as well just share it with him. We can hide it. We can lie about it. We can suppress it. Better to go to the Lord and say, Lord, this is in my heart. We've seen Abraham do that in his story. Uh, We've seen him go to the Lord and say, Lord, how will I know I will possess it? I don't have a son, Eliezer of Damascus. Abraham bore his heart to the Lord, and we should be confident to do that as well. Because the Lord knows what's in our hearts, and he's not going to reject us because he already knows what's there. So the principle for this section is that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. This is what the Lord said of himself. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. If we look at Ecclesiastes 3, 2 through 18, it's a famous section of scripture where we're told that there's a time for everything under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck, a time to kill, and a time to heal. And you might be saying to yourself, why do I recognize that refrain so much? Uh, It's been made into a song. Pete Seeger did it first. But then the Birds, uh, a British invasion group, really made this song famous, and they added the refrain, turn, 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 to it. And, uh, but it's, it's scripture. It's scriptural. And the author of Ecclesiastes was reiterating what he felt to be true about the world in that there, there was, there's a right time for stuff. You know, there's a right time to be born and a time to die and a time to plant and a time to harvest. And October is maybe the right time for Christmas lights. Maybe not. But, you know, we go through our lives thinking that there are seasons and that there are times that we're supposed to do things in. And, and people in our communities tend to, tend to think this of us as well. If you're single, people might say, well, isn't it time for you to find a spouse If you're recently married, someone might say, well, isn't it time for you to have children? And, and, you know, if if people do this all the time, we live, we live underneath the sense that there's expectations that are set on us that we're supposed to follow some pattern of our lives in order to experience uh, the fullness of life. And, and friends, uh, what God is saying to Sarah is that I can do anything. You might be in menopause, you might be too old, but I can still accomplish my vision, my mission for you in this world. And so friends, what is it that you feel like you've missed out on because the time is gone? 
that's too late for something, you're, you're too old, or the opportunity to do that is past, uh, I would challenge you and say that the Lord has the ability to accomplish something that doesn't meet our time expectations. Second of all, what would it look like for you and I to leave room for God to do something unexpected in our lives? How do we convey that? How do we convey that to ourselves and to others that we are waiting for God to potentially do something unexpected, unknown, um, and unanticipated, even though the time for something is drawing short? Well, my time is drawing short tonight. God has already established a plan for your life and for my life and for the lives of his people. He knows what he's doing, friends. We do not need to write our own stories or come up with uh, the way that we're going to connect the gaps of our lives in some way, shape, or form. What we do need to do is be patient and wait for the Lord. And it's easy for me to say this, and it's hard to do. I know that. You know that. Our job is to wait on the Lord and attempt to follow him. Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years for their first child to be born, and it was a long time to wait. And it was only the beginning of God fulfilling his promise to make Abraham and Sarai and Sarah into a great nation. Part of our role as followers of God is to wait well. Uh, Hopefully, you and I will not need to wait 25 years for whatever that thing is that we're waiting for, but we might need to. And so with that, Let's remind ourselves, as, this, as we're anticipating the advent of Jesus, that this is a season of waiting. Uh, it is potentially a lifetime of waiting. And uh, let's pray that God would help us do that well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great way that you interacted with Abraham and with Sarah uh, in this story. Father, I pray that you would help us, as Abraham's faithful offspring, to also wait well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to the St. Louis Young Adults BSF podcast. Join us next time on Zoom on Monday, December 14th at 7 p.m. Central as we discuss Genesis chapters 18 and 19. Please note that next week will be our last meeting of 2020 as we will be taking a Christmas break. Our class will not be meeting on December 21st and December 28th. However, we will return on Zoom on Monday, January 4th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Central. To connect with our class, like us on Facebook at STLYABSF or visit bsfinternational.org slash class slash 793. Bible Study Fellowship is an international, interdenominational, nonprofit organization that is dedicated to studying God's Word one verse at a time and strengthening the local church. For more information, visit bsfinternational.org. That's bsfinternational.org.